So you wrote a book. I wrote a book. <laughs> what were you thinking? I wrote a whole book. Uh, what were you thinking? How did that? Did you always know you were going to write no. a book, or how did this come about? No, you're an I astrophysicist. Had, I, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I had no idea I was going to write a book. I had no intention of writing a book. But um, you know, I've been doing a lot of science writing. I've been doing a lot of writing for magazines and stuff, and people were starting to notice, and I started getting these emails from people being like, hey, do you want to write a book? And uh, and I was like, I, I, I sure. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I thought about it for a few years. and, and um, About science, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and then, you know, at some point, it was, at some point I had an idea for what I wanted to write about. And um, so I said, yeah, I want to write about the end of the universe. Yeah. And that was a fun topic. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it sounds fun. Party party yeah. fun. Yeah. Kind of. so, so what's the name of the book? The, the book is called The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking. And <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. So I, at some point, you know, I, I connected with my agent and she, you know, we talked it through and we, we decided that like this would be, this would be a fun Topic <laughs> dark because dark. because yeah because because uh, I'm a little bit strange and I think that it's fun to think about these like big ultimate destruction things and it was you know and it was it was sometime you know 2017 people were feeling a little bit nihilistic about the world <laughs> and I thought you know maybe this is a good time to uh, to talk about just burning it all down all and, of it um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so so that's how it came about. So I mean, is the universe going to end? Yeah, yeah. Did, I mean, did the universe going. begin? This is so. This is the thing, right? Like the universe had a beginning, and so it pretty much has to have an end. Does right? it? Yeah. Uh, well, so it depends on it depends a little bit what you mean by end, because um, there are certain scenarios where something of space and time continues. But in, for my definition, it's, you know, everything that exists is over. <laughs> um, and that has to happen. Like, there's no, there's no scenario that, that astrophysicists or physicists take seriously right now that has us all living happily ever after in a nice, you know, pleasant universe that just keeps going. No. No. That's not one of the. That is I know not you discuss multiple scenarios, yeah. like the most likely, and you're not. You're saying that, that is not one of them. It does. <laughs> there's not, no happy ending. It does not end well. It does not end well. There is no. There is. There is no. You know, everything's great. Let's just are, keep are, going. Are these spoilers? Like, should I not read the book now that you've told me how the universe? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can't I start, have a happy ending. I start the book with the destruction of the Earth. So, I mean, if you're if you're not happy with. <laughs> With destruction, you're not gonna like the book. Um, because the yeah. destruction of the earth, that's yeah. gonna happen oh, yeah. way before the end of the universe. Yeah, so. yeah. We get there I mean, a billion years from now, the earth the, the oceans of the earth are boiled away and everything's over. So And that's know, because the sun changes? Yeah, yeah. So the sun will get a little bit um, a little bit brighter and expand a little bit and it doesn't have to change much. I mean it's a pretty big thing. It doesn't have to get much hotter. I mean, it's gonna be we're going to get 10% more energy at the at the position of the earth and that'll be enough to boil off the oceans. Mm. So, as soon as that happens and that's about a billion years. Some, so you, you know, just sort of take. start with that. Let's get yeah. this out of the way. Yep. Yep. The earth will be yeah. only here for another yeah, Well, I mean the earth will be here, bill, but it'll be years. uninhabitable. Oh, okay. Uh, for for a billion years or so, and then after that, the sun expands even more, swallows up a couple planets, um, and then you know the whole solar system is starting to look pretty bad at that point. But um, really, the meat of the book—it's not about yeah, the Earth. Yeah. No, it's not care. about like, us. It's not about no, the we, solar we system. Get, we get through that in like two pages. Okay, and so then, that you can take on the end of the and yeah, everything. Everything. <laughs> yep. So then, so how many different ways? Uh, there must be. A lot of theories. There are a lot of possibilities, yeah. So I, I look at five. Um, the idea there being, you know, these are these are kind of the ones people talk about the most. Um, and I talk about the different, you know, how likely each one is, what they would look like, um, what you would see if you were there, uh, how we're trying to figure it out. How but you won't thought, be there. You won't be there. <laughs> well, one of them you could be. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, but that's not even you say that as if it's cause for optimism. But I have a feeling it's worse than that. 
<laughs> There's one that we could be there for because it could happen even sooner. Yeah. 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 We, that's the... Uh, that's vacuum decay. So, well, what is vacuum decay? So, vacuum decay... This is... Is, is, this, is this your favorite? This is my favorite, by far. <laughs> yeah, no. This by is, far. This is the most... Fun. This is your favorite way. If you had to rank the ways yes. the universe might end, yeah. here's what comes in at number one for yes. Katie Mack. Yeah, yeah. It's... Uh, vacuum decay. Vacuum decay, which vacuum is decay. what? So, so, vacuum decay is where... Um, spontaneously, somewhere in the universe, a, a quantum event happens that creates a bubble, and this is a bubble of a different kind of space, and that bubble expands out at the speed of light and destroys everything in its path and just swallows up everything in the universe, and then the interior of the bubble collapses into a black hole. That's called that's vacuum decay, and it's the 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 fun thing about it is it could happen at any moment. It could happen right now, right here, and you wouldn't notice because it moves at the speed of light, so you don't see it coming. Uh, you There's don't no warning. It. There's no warning. You don't feel it. You don't even notice because it goes so fast. You know your nerve impulses don't travel that fast, so it's just you're just over, and everything else is over, and nobody you know nobody misses you. There's no you know big sad morning like nothing everything's done well then so this one you wouldn't even really get to witness so what no. makes it what makes it your favorite uh just the idea that that you know the universe could be that pathological <laughs> you know <laughs> just, it could just break it just could, yeah it right? could just it could just break it, i mean it's it's i i sometimes describe it as a manufacturer's defect in space time, <laughs> right? Like, is it, it's something that if it's if it's possible, it's possible. Like, because... if you remove this tag, yeah. is, is that what a quantum event is? What is? <laughs> you said it starts with a quantum event. Well, what does that mean exactly? Like, just a, a particle fluctuation kind of thing. I mean, I don't know how to describe the sort of it. thing that does happen. Yeah, like quantum. It's quantum tunneling. So quantum, quantum tunneling happens all the time. We use it for scanning tunneling microscopes. Like, we use it okay. in as a practical. Like so technology, it's a thing that happens. It's but totally but what would happens. be different about this that well, would cause would, the end of the universe? Because it would be the quantum tunneling of the Higgs field, which is a, a sort of energy field that pervades all of space, and it has something to do with how physics works and how mass works and all of that. And if that field underwent a quantum tunneling event, that's what would set it all off. And so the the cool thing about it is that it could just be built into our universe that this is possible. And if that's the case, then you know we're we're sort of balanced on the edge of something and could fall over, you know. Um, and it's if it's if it's possible at all, it's probably not going to happen for a really long time, um, you know, ten to the one hundred years or something. But that's like just that. statistics. Like that's statistics. It, that, it like could some of these moment. can only happen in yeah. the far future. Yeah. yeah. But this, this one, one could, could have already moment. happened. Yeah. The could, wave could, have, could be. Yeah. Coming it, could, to us. it could have happened at Saturn an hour and a half ago. You know, and it just hasn't got here yet. Should we wrap this up? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Sorry is all we have to say. Yeah. All the astrophysicists <laughs> are sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Wait, do you have a second? No, I don't. I know you probably haven't ranked them all. I, I have not ranked all of them though. That so that's the most. That's the most. So vacuum decay is the most fun. The is most, there one that you think is the most likely? Yes, the most likely end of the universe is something called heat death, uh. and it's not my favorite. It's not almost anybody's favorite because it's super depressing. <laughs> uh, and this is one where just the universe keeps expanding and expanding and speeding up in this expansion, and that means that other galaxies get so far away we can't see them anymore, and you end up with a universe where you know we can't see the rest of the universe, everything is dark, and then the stars within our own galaxy burn out and fade away and die, and then particles decay and black holes evaporate, and you just end up with this cold, dark, empty, lonely universe forever. That's heat death. <laughs> yeah. So, well, but in a way, you say it seems depressing, but that sounds like the universe nine of natural causes. Yeah. <laughs> and living yeah. a full, it's absolutely <laughs> fullest life. It's absolute fullest life it could possibly be. To the live. very yes. end, which yes. is very cold and lonely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even that one, you know, if you get into the, if you dig into the details of it, which is one of the things I do in the book, you do find some really weird, cool things, like the idea that from that dead, empty, lonely universe, you could sort of fluctuate through random processes, a new universe out of that, or another point in time in the same universe. You could have these weird little recurrences. And so lots of things can happen, sort of, maybe in this <laughs> quantum or, or, or just statistical way. Um, so it is an end of us, 
but it's not necessarily an end, you know, forever. Like there are other things that could happen. So even that one, which is absolutely the most depressing thing you could do to the universe, <laughs> um, even that could have something cool come out of it. You said that you get into uh, the details, but yeah. what level of detail do you get into? I mean, is this, who is this a book? I'm not a scientist. No. I love science books, yeah. um, but sometimes yeah, they can be a little yeah, yeah. too high level. So what yeah. is the level? Who is this for, I guess? So so this is this is not technical at all. So when I say I get into the details, I, I dig into the, the places where the really fun things happen, but I don't go into the technical stuff. I don't go into like equations. There's there's no, you don't have, need to have any Are there any equations? Background. There are a couple of equations. There's stuff like W equals minus one. They're not, they're, okay. you know, I mean, that's So you level. don't need to have any particular no. math, or do you need to bring much science knowledge nothing, to the book Nothing, before? no, no. So I assume you don't know any physics, any astronomy. Um, you know, it starts with, like, it starts with, you know, what is cosmology? What, it, what does it mean to study the universe? How does that work? You know, how do we do that? Then I talk about things like, you know, how do we learn about other galaxies? So, so it really starts with just you don't have to know anything. We're going to go through this all together. We're going to be, you know all in the same boat, <laughs> yeah. see how it goes, go down this stream, look at the waterfall, you know, um, it's, uh, so it gets, it gets a little bit deep, but not technical and you don't have to be already there, right? Yeah. So, so it's really for, I mean, I, I guess in terms of the audience I have in mind, it's people who are interested in science but don't have any background. Good. You know, and and maybe would... like maybe like high school kids would be you yeah. know this at that at the right level in terms of background. But even even younger than that, I think as long as you're old. But enough... do you think older adults could even handle it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. But I, I think. Do you have to be a high school? No. 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 And and I think as long as you're old enough to not be completely like freaked out by the end yeah. of the universe, you're probably old enough to. Yeah. Think about it. That said, if you are completely part... freaked out by the end of the universe you'll probably still be okay. <laughs> yeah. So y you said that the uh, the heat death yeah. seems like the most depressing end yeah. to a universe. Yeah. But of the scenarios that you describe, yeah. is there one that's less depressing? <laughs> is there is there an I mean, end of the universe that you find a little more uplifting than that? I mean, the, so vacuum decay is not depressing because you wouldn't see it coming you wouldn't notice it it basically is inconsequential it's right? dying it just, in your sleep it, yeah exactly it's just it's just like you know you're walking down the boom done you know uh for the universe we'll never be able to some of these we can predict like you a time frame like the heat death yeah you can probably start to get ideas of when yeah. you know a time the, scale the, for the but this of, the thing about the heat death yeah the heat death is you know that famous quote about the future is here it's just unevenly distributed that's true for the heat death, oh. because depending on where you are in the universe, you know, the heat death is where you have, you know, everything's expanding way faster and faster and you're empty. Or it's all empty and alone. In, there are some parts of the universe that already have less matter. You know, there are places where there aren't any galaxies, giant voids. Um, and so in those places, they're basically already getting there. They're already toward the heat death there. And, you know, the more, you know, if you're in the center of a galaxy cluster or something, you're, it's going to take longer to get to the heat death. But there are places now where basically the heat death is happening. And, and so in those places, you're kind of like, it couldn't get any worse. Yeah, I mean, there, it doesn't matter. Like, you're <laughs> yeah. already, it's but already... But for us, in a nice, warm place where we yeah. got yeah. a nice source of more energy coming yeah, down yeah. every so, day. So yeah, but, but one of the coolest... One of the coolest little facts um, yeah. about the end of the universe that I learned when I was researching this book is, so we can we can study how many stars have formed at different points in the history of the universe. We can we can do that because when we look at distant galaxies, we're looking into the past, and so we can watch, like we can see when stars formed, and we know that the the biggest burst of star formation was about 9 billion years ago. And um, and so that's when you had most stars forming. Hmm. But we can also see that the rate of star formation has gone down. And we can calculate into the future how many no new stars will be formed. And what we find is that as of now, 95% of the stars that have ever formed or ever will be formed have already been born. Really? And so from here to the end of time, we're just working on the last 5%. Really? Yeah. Well, why? It seems like you look out and there are trillions of galaxies, yeah. galaxies filled with stars in every direction. But you have to keep direction. in mind, every, you know, a lot of those galaxies, you're looking at them as they were millions or billions of years ago. You know, the, like into the future, there's just going to be less and less of that.
There are going to wow. be fewer galaxies colliding, and when, a gal when galaxies collide that forms new stars, you're going to have few less of that happening. So it's just, you know, we're kind of winding down already. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we're lucky to be here. You mentioned yeah. that, that the, the universe is expanding yeah. at, at, a, at an ever faster rate. Yep. And some things are receding so fast mm -hmm. that there's going to, and they're going to be receding even fast. So although nothing can move through space at the speed of light, yeah. objects can recede from us yeah. faster than the speed yeah, of light. Yeah, there's galaxies out there that are, they're, they're not moving and we're not moving, but the space in between us is getting bigger at such a rate that they seem to be moving away from us at more than the speed of light. At more than the speed of light. So yeah. and that doesn't break. Einstein's no. limit. So still things can't move through space faster yeah. than light, but but space can expand. So yeah. but this but the sad thing the, the very sad thing is we live in a special time where we look mm -hmm. out in a night sky filled with stars, but there could be intelligent beings throughout the universe mm -hmm. in some near future in a few billion years. Mm -hmm where they don't even see a night sky filled with stars. It would well, be, they would see the stars in their own galaxy, but they wouldn't see the other galaxies. I mean, then they just, wouldn't even be able to have a good cosmology, would they? Even here, in, a, in 100 billion years, we can't see other galaxies. That's how long it takes. 100 billion? 100 billion. By 100 billion years from now, other galaxies will be receding away from us so so quickly we'll be have, we'll have trouble 100 seeing. 100 billion, that's pretty far. So there's no yeah. Earth here, right. but, but something around here yeah. uh, yeah, like, there will, could be the, other... will the Milky Way galaxy yeah, last the Milky Way will still be. Years? Yeah, the Milky Way will still be here. A lot of the stars will be dead, but, you know, like, but that at that stage, um, you know, it, anybody who was born at that time wouldn't know cosmology exists. No, because they wouldn't even, it would yeah. be, all be pre-Hubble, because, yeah. right? Because before Hubble, they thought those other galaxies were just nebulae that were yeah. in our galaxy, right? Yeah. So, but there would be no... You would not be able to under, mm -hmm. you would never, there are yeah, there creatures are in a far know. future may never have a, yeah. a, a, not even a chance at a good yeah. uh, so we gotta view do of now. the universe. We gotta so we're really lucky. Yeah, because yeah, we can what, see the past and we can interpolate to the future, like, or, you know, extrapolate to the future. We know, we know where we've been. We can guess at where we're going. Wait a hundred billion years, it's too late. Do you talk <laughs> about... Yeah, I like how excited you get about this. <laughs> and it's, and that, and you talk about the, uh, uh -huh. you know, the more, it's like I'm thinking of births and funerals. Like, do you yeah. talk about the beginning of the universe I do, very yeah. much? Yeah, so I have a, a chapter, uh, the second chapter of the book. The first chapter is just an introduction. The second chapter is the beginning to now, like the Big Bang to today. So what, you know, just to get everybody on the same page, you know, how it all began, where what we've been through so far. And then I get into destruction, destruction, destruction. Yeah. Yeah. What, what made it, like, so when the idea came up that you were going to write a book, yeah. um, astrophysics is such a broad and beautiful subject. <laughs> yeah. How did you, uh, was, did, you know, how did, how did you settle on this as the idea that you wanted to write about? Well, I was, um, so <laughs> I was giving a talk uh, at a conference and Somehow I ended up talking about vacuum decay um, because it was it was just this weird idea of like everything could change immediately uh, suddenly and and it was a conference for like they invited me to give a, a talk at a conference for like entrepreneurs like tech people and I'm not in that space but I thought like well this is a cool weird science thing and I can make it inspirational about like <laughs> act now you know you never know when the universe might end. Um, and I had so much fun with that uh, that I thought like, oh, I can I can talk about other ways the universe could end. And then I thought, well, I could I have enough here. I could write a book about all the different ways the yeah. universe could end. And and it was a fun idea because it meant that I could throw in a whole lot of physics. You know, I mean, I I love physics. Obviously, I love astronomy and physics. And I just thought it would be so much fun to to talk about something that is itself cool and exciting and weird and dramatic, but also be able to say, hey, by the way, you know, this is what entropy means, you know, and this is how, um, you know, the Doppler shift works for light. So you can and work a lot of stuff of in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with I got this into, as a framework. Yeah, so I got into all sorts of stuff about gravity, about particle physics. I mean, and not, you know, I'm like, not in a way that you should be intimidated or anything. It's, right. it's very much, you know, here's some cool stuff. I'm going to help you understand this because it's just so interesting. And then that ties into how the universe is going to end. So, yeah. so 
there are a lot of topics that I thought it'd be really fun to go into that I think are, you know, people don't really get to dig into those things because they're think like, oh, maybe that's complicated. But I really do keep it, you know, pretty easy, I think, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely worked really, really hard to make sure it was all like, you know, lightweight and easy, but, but that you could actually learn something from it. Did you always know you wanted to be a scientist? And did you always know you wanted yeah. to be a physicist and an yeah. astrophysicist? Basically. Really? I mean, I think, I think I was probably about 10 when I started reading Brief History of Time. And I was like, I watched a movie about Stephen Hawking and I was like, this stuff sounds awesome. <laughs> I want to learn about black holes and space time and time travel and all of this kind of thing, wormholes and things. And so I found out that Stephen Hawking is called a cosmologist, like his job, that's cosmologist is his job. And I was like, okay, I want to be a cosmologist. We're done, good. <laughs> uh, and so then I studied physics in college and went to astrophysics grad school and studied cosmology and that's what I do. So uh, that was a lot of fun. I, I even, for a while I worked at Cambridge University and, and there was a time when I had an office like directly below Hawking's office. Really? I used to, yeah, I used to go to dinners with him and stuff, and and uh, he came to a talk I gave once, which was wild. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Did he ask any questions? Or he did, did he not ask heckle any you or anything. Yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other story. Is that a, if there's a story there? Yeah, he kind of heckled me. <laughs> <laughs> did he really? What do you mean? Um, okay, so oh, this is a long story, but. Um, so I, yeah, I was giving a talk about primordial black holes, which is an idea that he came up with, basically him and some others. And, and this is at Cambridge? This is at Cambridge. And what is a primordial black hole? It's a black hole formed in the very early universe, like basically right after the Big Bang. Um, so yeah, I was giving a talk about that and he was in the audience and, and um, you know, as soon as I put up my title slide and said I was going to talk about primordial black holes, I hear this mechanical voice say, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's funny and everybody kind of laughs and yeah. we're like it's pretty obvious who said nobody ever asked to go who said no. that <laughs> right exactly um but then as i kept going in the talk every once in a while i would hear no or yes or i don't know really? or i don't think so or whatever like just these weird little phrases and i i would stop and i would look at him and he would just kind of look at me and i didn't know what was going on it was a lunch seminar so he's eating his Maybe lunch he pressed the wrong button so i i had no idea right and and i can't you can't say like please repeat yourself yeah because it's not easy it's a slow yeah. process for, yeah it, it takes a long that, time to get the yeah. yeah yeah the way it worked was that it had it, he had this um like optical thing that would look at his cheek and he would like squint to choose words on this menu it would control there was a moving yeah, cursor yeah. and it's yeah, yeah. And, and so, so he can't and so, engage in right. a fast-paced conversation right. yeah yeah and so i had no idea what was going on so every t so the first couple of times i'd stop and i'd look confused and everybody else would kind of just stare at me and the, you know there's a whole what bunch of like professors in the room <laughs> staring at me and i was grad student this time i had no idea what was going on and there's my hero stephen hawking just you know. said no to something <laughs> yeah and i had no idea what um, you know and i didn't know if it was like two slides earlier or whatever oh, right. um and so i just had to like do a, you know respectfully pause and then carry on because what else am I going to do? Right. And so I finished the talk. Um, you know he takes off. You know they you know he, he get taken away in the wheelchair and everything. And I asked somebody like, what was going on with Hawking? Like yeah, what, yeah. what was that? And they're like, oh well you know that little thing that looks at his cheek. It malfunctions when he eats. Oh. So because he was, it was a eating. lunch talk. It was a lunch talk. <laughs> yeah. So because he was. So eating. it was like you know I kind of yeah. almost imagined it was like a little out of no. control. No, no, maybe. Sorry, sorry. It totally. It was totally just that he was accidentally choosing from like the quick select menu without of yes, to. no, maybe, whatever. Yeah, and I had no, and nobody warned me. This happens every time. And nobody told me, so wow, I was there, okay. like quaking in my boots. So, because so throughout you're like, oh my yeah, God, he, yeah, he, I'm. I'm what yeah. an exciting moment, but he disagrees with all my yeah, conclusions. Yeah, I had no idea what was going on. It was the <laughs> well, most stressful relief, huh? talk I've ever given in my life. Because, I mean, <laughs> how would you feel if you're like, yes, you're giving a talk and, you're, and your hero is incomprehensibly heckling you? Yeah, <laughs> I love the that. audience. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it didn't but, mean anything at all. Well, unlike the universe, that has a happy ending. <laughs> While you were writing the book, did yeah. you start to get, or maybe you already have an idea of what your next book might be? <laughs> Is it too soon? I know that oh, yeah. so, you just finished writing one. Yeah. Um, so when I when I made the agreement with the publisher um, that they would be the ones to publish the book, um, as part of that agreement, it was like, you know, oh, we get first dibs on your next book. And so when I was meeting with the publishers, I had to 
have an idea in mind. Um, so I do have an idea. You mind, have an but idea. I'm not okay. telling you. All right. Excellent. <laughs> we'll have to wait. Yeah. We'll have to let this one come out. Yeah. Yeah. See how it goes. You know, I mean, maybe it'll be a disaster. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it could just, you know, it could just be like everything is destroyed and, and you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So you've been... Um, an astrophysicist, mm -hmm. a, a cosmologist, a researcher mm -hmm. for many years. Mm -hmm. You've been a science writer for the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, yeah. scientists, people may not realize how much writing scientists have to oh, do yeah, yeah. in terms of publishing their own work yeah. for other scientists in their field. Yeah. But you've done a lot of science writing for the public for yeah. various publications. Yeah. And you also have been really prolific on social media, mm -hmm. especially Twitter, mm -hmm. in, in to the extent that I would absolutely call it, you know, it's science communication and it's yeah. it's it's it actually kind of pave the way to your deal with your agent and publishers, the, the fact sure. that you have a very successful, yeah. uh, you have a big following of like yeah. 300,000 people or something, something like that. that. Um, but, okay, so through all of this, this uh, research and communication you've done, tell me something, is there something that you learned about yourself in the process <laughs> of writing a book or, uh, or anything like what was it like to write a book for the first because this is nothing like anything you've done oh, before no, right no I mean, the, the, yeah. yeah the longest thing I wrote before this was my thesis which is a totally different kind of writing because uh, that's a technical writing and that was just take a bunch of papers and write an introduction and stuff like that um, and the longest thing I'd ever written for the public was maybe a thousand words. I mean, not that much. <laughs> this one's 63,000 words. 63,000 words. What does yeah. that mean? How long a book is it? Uh, like 150 pages-ish, maybe 200. That's I don't a know. nice, it's, it's a decent easy read. That's readable. It's a decently sized <laughs> book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little bit, I think it's going to be a little bit longer than A Brief History of Time, if that gives you a Oh, that's good. Feeling. Yeah, that's just a, a little size. bit longer, not much. Because, you know. Yeah. Big books can be intimidating. A big yeah. fat science book could be intimidating. Yeah. That sounds so like a great size. It's a, it's a reasonable size, I think. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a different process, you know. So you have to write a little bit every day, you know. And so what I did basically is I went to coffee shops and I sat there with my laptop and I wrote uh, a little bit every day uh, for a couple of, like, you know, 18 months or something. Um, there were times when I wrote less because I got caught up in, you know, research or travel or teaching or whatever. But... It was basically, you know, I, I had deadlines for each chapter that I wanted to do, and I did the chapters basically in order. Um, and I just, you know, I'd do a little bit of research in the literature if I if I didn't know something, but I, I had an outline. I knew kind of which topics I wanted to cover. And because I work in cosmology, I knew the material mostly already. I, there wasn't a whole lot that I had to learn just for the book because um, it's stuff that, you know, floats around in the field. Although you did about. conduct a lot of interviews yeah, so with uh, I did a lot various of other successful yeah. researchers. Yeah, so the, the interviews were mostly for the last chapter and for the epilogue. So the last chapter is about, um, it's about how we're going to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, first I go, th I go through five different ways the universe could end, and then I have a chapter about, you know, how do we know? What, what are the observations, what are the experiments that we're going to do that are going to answer these questions? And for that, as a theorist, I don't have the background in that. Yeah. And I wanted to know what people are really thinking about that. Like, who's working on these questions? What are, what are the big ideas? You know, how, where is it all going? And so I went around all over the world and I was asking, um, you know, a bunch of researchers, like, what do you think about this? What, where is this field going? What are the big new experiments with big new observations? Uh, what are we going to learn? What are we going to learn in the next 20 years? Um, you know, how, how are we going to find out? And so that was really, really interesting. Who were some of the people you spoke to? Oh, um, I talked to, I mean, I talked to a few people whose names you might recognize. Um, Roger Penrose, Sir Roger Penrose, sorry, uh, at Oxford, a famous mathematician and physicist, um, Sir Martin Rees, Lord Martin Rees, Lord Martin Rees, <laughs> who is the Astronomer Royal of, of the UK, uh, of England, um, who's uh, at Cambridge University. Um, I talked to Nima Arkhani Hamed, who's a really big deal in particle physics. Um, I talked to Hrania Pirius, who's a, a famous cosmologist at, um, at University College London. Um, I went to the Perimeter Institute and talked to Neil Turok, who is uh, somebody who works on new ideas for how the universe began and ends. Um, uh, Paul Steinhardt, my PhD advisor at Princeton. 
uh, just a ton of different people. Um, Clifford Johnson, a string theorist in, in LA. Um, Sean Carroll, who's a um, fairly well-known science writer and physicist and cosmologist at uh, Caltech. So yeah, a ton of different people. Did you find yourself agreeing or disagreeing on like, um, in particular disagreeing, I mm -hmm. guess, with, with some of these people about anything? Did you get into any um, arguments? Um, not arguments, no. I mean, I, I, was, I was going to get perspectives, right? right? Um, there were definitely different ideas about what kinds of questions are, um, like what are the interesting new mysteries and how seriously should we take things that look like they might point to new uh, ideas, right? So I definitely had very different views expressed about that. Oh yeah, and like what kind really of ideas are we talking about? What mysteries? Oh, things like um, there, there are some, <laughs> So for example, uh, there are a couple of different ways of measuring how fast the universe is expanding right now, and some of those disagree with each other. Mm. And some people think maybe that means that there's some new aspect of cosmology we don't understand yet. Other people think measurement error. You know? And so there were definitely big disagreements between people yeah. on those kinds of questions. And then also on things like, you know, what what is the most promising direction for research in cosmology? and um, you know, how seriously should we take uh, certain theories for how the universe might end and, and stuff like that. So that was really interesting too. So interestingly, this subject of this, your first book, mm -hmm. um, the end of the universe, it's not, uh, although it's in your field of cosmology, it's not the nature of your specific research, no, is it? No, no, So no. what is your research about well, today, these days? I mean, my research is mostly about dark matter. Um, so different ideas for what the most of the matter in the universe is, this invisible stuff that holds galaxies together. But lately, I've been getting more and more interested in the end of the universe. So I have <laughs> been doing some research that relates to specifically vacuum decay, but um, thinking about you know the far future of the universe. And, uh, and I don't know. I, I've gotten really interested in it because of, uh, because of thinking about the things in this book. That's really. fascinating. So yeah. just the process of writing this book for the public yeah. has uh, affected the direction of your research. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, definitely. So of the five scenarios, we haven't talked about all five of them, but mm -hmm. you said that the heat death is the most, seems like the most likely outcome. Yeah. Is of your five, which is the least likely to happen, do, um, you, do you think? I think the least likely is the big crunch. Uh, so this is the one I start with, um, where basically the big crunch is where the universe is currently expanding, but at some point it turns around and recollapses. So the crunch is it yeah, the crunch collapsing is, back yeah, yeah. from whence it came? Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, and that that's something that in the, there was a time in the 60s when they really thought that was going to happen. And since then, we've got more data that says actually the universe, the expansion of the universe is speeding up, not slowing down. And so if it's speeding up, that makes it very unlikely it's going to stop and turn around. Uh, so that's probably the least likely. So, but so you include it because, like, historically, it was yeah. a pretty popular. That yeah. was like thought, like, it's yeah. either gonna yeah. keep yeah. expanding or it's gonna collapse. Yeah. So I include it partially for historical reasons and partially because we also don't know for sure. You know, it's there, either gonna keep expanding or collapse or just rip or or <laughs> various piece, other or, things. Yeah. yeah. yeah, Wait, yeah. What else? So, so okay, we've so got a big crunch. big crunch. We've got the heat death. Yeah. Those are sort of opposites, right? Yeah. Yeah. So big crunch is where the expansion reverses, heat death is where it keeps going and goes faster and faster and faster. The big um, rip all of a sudden just... The big rip is where dark energy... Oh wait, that's energy, not quantum decay. The, no. That, okay, that's, oh, so what that's is the, the big so rip? So the big rip yeah. is where dark energy, which is what's making the universe expand faster and faster, gets more powerful somehow and starts to not just make empty space get bigger, but also kind of rips apart galaxies oh. and then planets and then everything. <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the big rip is a scenario where in the distant future, like space itself gets ripped apart by the expansion. Is there something like why, what would cause, is there a, an, a, a theoretical basis? For I mean, it's that? a different kind of dark energy. Uh, mm. It's called phantom dark energy, but it's just a theoretical possibility that may or may not really be possible. It's it's inconsistent with certain ideas about how the universe works and we don't know for sure. But that's one that people sometimes talk about, the big rip. Then I talked about vacuum decay, which is this one where you have this bubble that expands and destroys everything in the universe <laughs> based on a quantum tunneling event in one spot. That could happen in, in any moment. 
Uh, and then I talked about bouncing cosmologies, where you have some kind of situation where the universe kind of goes from you know, this current expansion to some kind of maybe compression and then like new Big Bang or, or you know, various ways you could have a new Big Bang um, yeah. within our universe in a cycle. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that people talk about for uh, various reasons, but I, I talk about a few of those possibilities as well. So those are the five. Um, you said that along the way to learning about the ends of the universe, yeah. uh, the possible ends of the universe, that um, we learn a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. And maybe one, I, I suspect one of the things we learn is something about dark energy and dark matter. Mm -hmm. And maybe people get a little confused. They sound similar because yeah. one is dark energy and one is dark matter, but... They're but, very different. Yeah. They're basically opposite. Yeah, so dark matter is a kind of matter. So matter is something that has mass. Uh, like, you know, I mean, we are matter, right? We are stuff with Speak mass, that's gravity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so dark matter is a kind of matter, but it's a kind of matter that doesn't interact with light, so we can't see it. So light doesn't reflect off of it, it's not, it doesn't absorb light. Um, so it's some kind of matter that seems to not interact with light. If we can't see it, how do we know it's there? Well, we see the gravitational effects. So it doesn't have, it doesn't interact with light, but it does have gravity. And so it, it creates, you know, gravitational fields because there's a whole lot of it collected, you know, in galaxies and stuff. And so when we see galaxies rotate, we see that the stars are going faster than they should because there's got to be more matter holding them in, and that's this invisible dark matter. And we it's calculatable, right? It's yeah, like you can and we can see it, yeah. So we see it partially in the way that galaxies move, but also in a whole bunch of other ways in the universe. In um, the way, actually, galaxy clusters move, too? Yeah, like, do we know yeah. something? Do, yeah. Can we see movement on a we scale? Don't see, that big? We don't see movement, per se. We see sort of signs of movement. Like, we see how the light is affected by the motion. We see. We can also see things like how light is bent around dark matter. Now, I said it doesn't interact with light, but it does interact with the shape of space. Everything that has matter bends space. And, and bent space can cause light to, to bend. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it's like a lens. It's called gravitational lensing. So the more matter there, the stronger the bending of space. And so the stronger the bending of the light beams. So, so it can, can gravitationally affect light. Yeah. But every other part of the light spectrum we're not seeing anything there. I mean, it's just like the light can pass through, but because it's bending space, light that would be going around it bends, yeah. you know. So, so anyway, so we can see dark matter through its effects on other things, through its gravity. Um, but it's something that clumps, you know, our galaxy is embedded in a clump of dark matter. It's, you know, clumpy throughout the universe, and it's matter. It I know matter, that there are some people... Um, and not just crackpots, there are some physicists that, that might think dark, what we're calling dark matter might really just be a, a, us not fully understanding gravity. I mean, there are a couple of people who seem to suggest uh, things like that, but the data is not on their side. Like, no. there's, there's, um, it's, there are certain, there are certain things that happen with how individual galaxies, like how the stars within galaxies move, um, that uh, some people think they could explain with other means. But when you look at all the evidence together, um, the bending of light with gravitational lensing, the way that dark matter affected the early universe, the way it affects matter on large scales, like it really, like it's, there's much more evidence on the side that dark matter is something real that we just can't see. Some people have a real problem with the idea that you can't see it, that we haven't detected this particle. And they think, well, if we can't see it, if we haven't detected the particle, it must not really be there. But we have lots of evidence that it's there. Yeah, but I mean, the whole history of science is about detecting things that we couldn't detect in the past, like microbes, yeah. germs, atoms, yeah. Yeah. molecules. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of inference, you know. Right, um, infrared, ultraviolet x-rays. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot of, you have to, you know, some of the evidence is indirect, but it's, there's a lot of evidence for dark So matter. there's a lot of evidence for it, but it's, it's been called dark because literally we can't see yeah, it. We can't see and it. also we just don't know don't enough know, about yeah. it, right? Yeah. So, and, and in that sense, dark energy is just, so, it's so, another thing that we don't know that much about. Yeah. So but, there, energy, but we know enough that there's something happening well, yeah, that so needs a label. We, need, we know a lot less about dark energy than we know oh, about really? dark matter. Yeah. So dark energy is called dark energy because we can't see it and we don't know what it is. 
but um, the way it acts is almost opposite dark matter. So dark matter like pulls things into it because it has gravity. Dark energy stretches out space. And that's pretty much all it does. It just makes space expand faster. Um, and we don't know why. We don't know what it's made of. You know, it might be some kind of new field, uh, energy field in the universe. It might be a property of space, uh, something yeah. called a cosmological constant. Right. Does it have to be uh, this thing, or is it just space does this? It might just be this space is how does space this. behaves. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a cosmological This is how a concept. universe behaves. Yeah, yeah. So it might be that. Um, but whatever it is, it, it, its effect is that it makes space expand faster. And uh, so in that sense, dark matter and dark energy are very opposite. But dark energy is really hard to study because you don't have that many handles on it. It's uniform throughout space, as far as we can tell. And all it does is make tr space expand faster. There's no, like, you know, you can't study how it's clumping around galaxies because it doesn't clump. Uh, it doesn't seem to change with time, really. Like the way that, like the amount of it that's out there seems to be constant over time, um, and it's just like embedded in space. It, like, how do you study? This? So you can study the way that the expansion has varied over time, and you can ex you can study how um, you know how things, how galaxies and things formed, because that's affected by how space is expanding. But that's kind of it. So it's very hard to learn about. If we know so little about dark energy. Mm -hmm then how do we know that that, that component of the universe, that, that makes up like 75% of the universe, like and then dark matter is like 20%, and then just like, that, like yeah. everything that we thought was everything, until just yeah. decades ago, yeah. everything that we thought was everything is like five turns out to be like 5%. Yeah. And then dark matter is a big chunk, mm -hmm. but the biggest, and I've never understood that thing of like, so like, what does it mean that, that we know so little about it? How can you say that it's what makes up 75% of the universe? It's, it's around 70%. 70. But the, the way that we can do that is um, we can figure out, it's basically, first we figure out how the universe is expanding and what, what sort of the large scale sort of geometry of the universe is. And by geometry, I don't mean look at it from the outside and see what shape it is. I mean how how shapes work inside the universe. Bear with me here. So for example, in certain kinds of universes, if you shine two laser beams parallel, they will come together. That's called a closed universe. Other kinds of universe, you shine two parallel beams and they go apart. That's called an open universe. And that has to do with the shape of space itself. Like what, does, what space does to the light. And our, um, universe, our universe, that's is, not what happens, right? Our universe, two parallel light beams would stay parallel. Um, on large scales, and that's called a flat universe. It doesn't mean that we're flat, it just means that there's no curvature interior to space that, that on the large scales that would affect it. And so by knowing that the universe is flat and knowing that the expansion is accelerating, you can work out how much of the sort of energy density of the universe is in different components. So you understand how matter affects the expansion of the universe, how energy, you know, um, like radiation affects the expansion, how uh, something like dark energy expects the expansion. So you can figure out how much that has to be. Yeah. Is there a question you most want the answer to? Or questions? Um, I mean, I want to know what dark matter is made of. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> and that's what research. you're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, yeah, because uh, that's a big question. Like, if we, and the thing about dark matter is we know it's some kind of matter, right? It's probably some kind of new particle. Uh, some particle that is not included in the particles we know about right now. Those are called the, we have the standard model of particle physics, all the particles of nature that we've ever detected. It doesn't, it's, it's not one of those. Um, so whatever dark matter is, it's new physics, which means that it might point us the way to a new theory of physics that could explain everything, right? So, so that's called beyond, beyond standard model physics. Right, so, there's a standard model and yeah. we know that it's, there's some problems with it yeah. as it's been really successful to explain so much, yeah, I mean, but it has passed, some problems, it's right? It's passed every experimental test we've ever thrown at it, but theoretically there are some issues with it and also it doesn't include anything that could be dark matter. So 
there has to be some tweak to it. It might be a small tweak. Some people suggest that, you know, dark matter is some kind of some new kind of neutrino that we haven't already included, and then that's a little tweak. But it could be something really big. So it could, it could be, be something that sort of fits with the standard model and just like yeah, expands, just expands it. it a little bit. But it could be something that it could just be something throws very different. The, yeah. I mean, it does, it's not going to throw out no. the standard model, in the but sense more like relativity like, to yeah. Newton. Yeah, yeah, it could that, be something that, that Newton points is the still way. pretty valid. But in these extreme cases. Yeah. It turns out you need relativity to yeah, explain things. Yeah, so it things. could point the way to some some really new model that that you know it, you know something like string theory or whatever that really answers other questions of physics. So it's really important that we figure out what this dark matter is, and as soon as we find out, then we can really get going. The problem the problem we're having right now, and this is something I talk about in the book toward the end. We have a standard model of particle physics that's passed every experimental test we've thrown at it. We have uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, general relativity, the theory of gravity, has passed every experimental test we've thrown at it. Um, we have this cosmological model called the concordance model of cosmology that's dark matter, dark energy, you know, the Big Bang, inflation, cosmic inflation, rapid expansion of the early universe, seems to fit all the data. But none of these things is fundamental. Like none of, like, Gravity and and the standard model particle physics don't work well together. Dar the the cosmology model that we have, the concordance model, sounds great, but we don't know what dark matter or dark energy are, and those are most of the universe. We don't know why the Big Bang happened, you know, inflation, if it even happened at all. All this stuff we don't understand. So we have all these really great descriptions of ma of uh, the universe of nature, but we don't know why they work. And if we can figure out something like dark matter, that would go a long way to potentially answering a bunch of these questions. Dark matter, dark energy, if we can figure out what those are, then we are, we are much closer to having real understanding. Right now we have a great description, but understanding, I don't know, because we don't <laughs> know why it works. You know, I love space, I love astrophysics, but I sometimes, Oh, contemplating the very largest scale things yeah. and the very smallest scale things. To me, I'm filled with awe, but sometimes I'm sort of filled with terror <laughs> and horror, and yeah. I don't understand yeah. what 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 an infinite universe could even mean, yeah. but what could a finite universe yeah. mean? So you've just spent a year or more, two years, two years <laughs> thinking about this sort of stuff, yeah. and even darker, like thinking about the end of the universe yeah. is this. So for two years, has this like messed with your head? Have you, uh, you know, yeah, just thinking bit. so much about the a end of everything? Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's definitely been a head trip. I mean, it's <laughs> there's definitely something weird about, you know, Every day in the morning, I get my tea and you know my <laughs> little oatmeal at the at the cafe, and I start you know, and then the galaxies are ripped apart, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you know that being in that headspace is a very strange thing, and especially toward the end of the book where I'm talking about where things are going next and and asking people you know their opinions about the future of physics, the future of the universe. This is a very weird place to be. It's a very strange thing to think about, and. I don't know. It has definitely affected my outlook. You know, I mean, I think. Do you some... consider yourself an optimist or pessimist? <laughs> and, would, and did you have a different uh, answer two years ago? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, it definitely makes you feel like, you know, your little problems are not that big, right? I mean, the the whole universe is going to end, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, how seriously can we take things? And that that can be a little bit freeing. That can be a little bit yeah. cheering. You know, just to think like, well, you know whatever we do here, we are such an insignificant thing. We can just, you know, appreciate um, what we're doing and, and not worry too much. Um, but it's also a little bit daunting because if the universe is gonna end, even if it's gonna end and so far in the future you don't, you can't really think about it, that means at some point we don't have a legacy, right? There's, a, there's some point at which our, the, the consequence of our existence no longer matters, right? And that's a hard thing to wrap your head around, because even if you're okay with your own personal death, usually the reason people are okay with their own deaths is because, like, oh, something of me will live on. You know, maybe in children, my children or, or my a works, book I wrote, you know, or a whatever. Building right, I designed. right, yeah. And and if the whole universe is going to end, that's not true anymore. You know? No legacy. I mean, at some point, that's not true anymore. And 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 you know, for some people, that's so far in the future, it doesn't matter. But for some further people, the fact that it's you know infinite versus not infinite mm -hmm. makes a difference. But a legacy of a hundred billion years is not sure. bad. Sure, sure, sure. But then at some point, 
it's done. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I have definitely found talking to people that some people really did see that distinction very clearly between we go on forever and we do not go on forever. Uh, and so that was a really interesting thing to confront in this book. What does it mean that it will all end at some point? You know, that, that there will be a point when n none of us is remembered. You know, none of us mattered. That's a weird thought. And so, so I talked to a bunch of people about this. I, I, when I was going around interviewing people about research, I was also asking them this question, like, how do you feel about the end of the universe? I, I asked that question to uh, you know, a dozen luminaries in the field. And, uh, and I got a bunch of different answers. And some people were like, well, this is really sad. <laughs> and other people said, actually, it's kind of freeing. You know, it's kind of freeing the idea that it doesn't go on forever, that we're a little blip. And we can just enjoy what we have and we can and it can be meaningful because it's happening now even though it's not going to be written down in stone you know in the far future and that that was a really interesting thing to come to terms with to to think about what does it mean for life to be meaningful now as a temporary thing and and yeah i i think i i got a lot out of that i think it was it was an interesting exercise to go through and i think an important one because it you know i think we should think about it in those terms. We should think about what does it mean right now rather than relying on like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe they'll talk about me in a hundred years. Maybe not, you know, and if, if they're not going to be talking about us, what, how do we live our lives now so that we find it meaningful? I, I, I thought it was, I mean, it's getting a little sentimental and stuff, but I, I thought it was a really powerful thing to think about and very, you know, it really did change my outlook on life and, and the meaning of everything. Well, like I talk, when people talk about longevity, there's some mm -hmm. people that say that if that that death, that if we were immortal, yeah, uh, our lives wouldn't have that, that somehow it would, it would uh, make our lives. Our lives yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I yeah. see the argument, but I also want more life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as, yeah, they, as, as Roy Batty says in Blade Runner, yeah. and um, I'm not sure if I could spend the rest of at least the Earth's lifespan, reading books and consuming art that other people have, uh, that I, I think that would be a pretty good existence. Yeah. But, um, if, if, so this, this universe, um, <laughs> is this everything? I mean, you said the universe had a beginning yeah, yeah. and it'll have an end, but is it possible that there was something before the beginning of the universe, which sounds like a weird, is, are yeah. there other universes? Could, could this, could there maybe be some legacy beyond the end of the universe? Something somehow gets passed on yeah. into a newborn universe. Well, interestingly, that that was one of the one of the things that uh, that came up when I was asking people about this. Like, some people were saying, "Well, it's not all about us." You know, maybe there's some other part of the universe or the multiverse or whatever where things do go on, and that you know, maybe that. I mean, they're not carrying on our legacy. They know nothing about us, but maybe like something carries on. Um, so there could be parts of the universe that are so far away we can't observe them and they might have totally different fates. Um, there could have been something before what we consider to be the Big Bang. There's a, a sort of point at which we're, we can't really see before that. And if there was a before that, which we don't know, maybe something totally different was happening there. And maybe after our part of the universe fades out or whatever, maybe something else will carry on. We don't really know. And there is a limit to what we can ever observe. It's called the observable universe. We can't see beyond that, no matter what, just based on the laws of physics and how light travels. And beyond that, we don't know what happens. So we don't know if there are other parts of the universe maybe where the laws of physics are different and they have a totally different evolution, a totally different fate. It's hard to say, we, we just have no idea. So what do you expect or hope that someone will take from this book when they read it? Like, yeah. did, did, were you thinking that way yeah, when you're writing it? I was, sure. Um, I mean, obviously one thing I hope is that they'll enjoy reading it, that it'll be fun. And I do think it's fun. I think is that it these fun? are fun Your topics. Twitter stream, you're very yeah. poetic and humorous. Yeah, it's and very while much explaining the, science. It's very much in the same tone as my Twitter feed. So there's a lot of jokes. There's a lot of... No uh, paragraph more than 140 characters? <laughs> Maybe that's no, a little... Expensive. that would be going too far. <laughs> but there, there are jokes. There are, you know, I keep, I keep it pretty lighthearted. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I, I like, it does get kind of deep sometimes, you know, it gets kind of heavy, but, you know, in a way that I think I, I try to keep it pretty accessible. What I hope people get out of the book is 
just a sense for what we know about the universe and how we're learning about it and why we ask these questions. Because the end of the universe, it's not going to affect us, right? There's, there's really no way that whether the universe is going to last, you know, you know, 100 billion years or, 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 you know, many, many, many orders of magnitude beyond that, or if it's going to have a big rip or if it's going to have a big crunch or collide with another universe, like that's not going to affect our lives here on Earth. You know, nothing is likely to happen in the next 4 billion years. And by the end of 4 billion years, the sun is going to be pretty much done. And, you know, we're good, right? Um, so so it's nothing personal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, so, and it really doesn't affect our personal right. lives in any way that's meaningful or, or likely. But we still, as humans, want to understand these things, right? Like, we have a basic curiosity about our origins, about our fate as a cosmos, you know, as a species, as a cosmos, as as reality. And so one thing I hope people get out of the book is like, why we even ask these questions? Like, what is the point of asking these questions? What do we learn by asking these questions? Because you learn a lot about how the universe works by asking hypothetical questions like, well, what if this happened in the far future? What does that tell us about how physics works right now? Um, and I hope that people learn, you know, I hope people get that out of it, get like just the point of this kind of endeavor <laughs> and a better understanding for where we came from and where we're going and, and what we can actually know about the universe. I hope people learn something about the universe and also just get an appreciation for, you know, just thinking in these terms. Um, and maybe, maybe if, you know, ideally, uh, people get a different perspective on their own lives the way that I did. You know, uh, when you think about the universe as this bigger, powerful thing that you don't have control over, that can change how you think about your own life. And if you think about the universe as being something that could die in the far <laughs> future, maybe that changes how you think about your own life and your own mortality and stuff. So I, I do kind of hope it it sparks some reflection and a change in perspective, but I also just want people to learn something and enjoy it and have fun and, and you know, get to take a break from mundane reality and think about, you know, the whole universe being ripped apart because that's a fun topic, right? <laughs> like that's a very big dramatic thing. And it's, it's sometimes fun to think about big dramatic scary things that nonetheless can, do not personally threaten us.